It is great to see you all. Um, as he just said, my name is Luke, and we're really excited to tell you a little bit about the history, how MapLibre got started, where we are today, and where we hope to head in the future. So who are we? Um, I'm Luke. I'm CEO and co-founder of Stadium Apps, and that's why I was so interested in creating this project that we all know as MapLibre. And since the beginning, um, I've been on the board, and we also have Bart. Hi, uh, my name is Bart. I'm uh, actually a GIS uh, rookie. Um, before I started working for MapLibre uh, as a maintainer, at the beginning of this year, I was mostly a web developer. So a lot of this stuff is pretty new to me. So when we were pre preparing this presentation, a lot of times I said, let's say this, I didn't know this. And Luke said, oh yes, everyone knows this. So uh, I think we struck a good balance with uh, being also beginner friendly. So what is Map Libre? Um, on the one hand, it's kind of an idea. And on the other hand, it's a very practical tool that you can use to create maps on a lot of different platforms. Uh, there's a SDK for native platforms, so Android, iOS, and a lot of other platforms, and also on the web. Um, Right, so uh, these are split into two uh, libraries. Uh, one is called MapLibre GLJS, and that's the one you would pick when you um, make an application that runs in the browser, and when you wanna make a mobile application on iOS or Android, uh, MapLibre Native is the one to pick. So what makes MapLibre special? There's a lot of map rendering toolkits out there. Um, some of them have been around for a lot longer than MapLibre. And it really all comes down to one thing. Um, and this is slowly changing, but it is one of the only renderers that does everything on the client side. So I'm not sure how many of you know what this is. Um, it's a GPU. It renders graphics very quickly. And that is the core difference of MapLibre. It uses graphics libraries to create a immersive experience for the user. You can zoom in quickly, you can zoom out, you can pan around, and it's this smooth experience compared to the old map experience of loading images from a server, hoping they all load on time, and it's a little bit janky. And it also enables something called runtime styling. So instead of having to change some settings on the server, render an image, and, and send it out, you can actually change all of the way the map looks and feels live in the client application. So users can pick what is displayed and it comes in and out. You can change colors, you can change almost everything about the map kind of at runtime. Right, good to mention here, rendering is a fancy word for drawing, right? So the, the, the map is being drawn on the client at uh, probably 60 frames per second or maybe a bit Hopefully. higher. Hopefully. Right. And again, if, if we don't remember what it takes to make a map, it all starts with good data. I think we all know where to get good data. I think there's this project called OpenStreetMap or it. something like that. And then we take that data, we turn it into what are called vector tiles. Um, these are little sections of the earth that are broken up of, the, of the, the data. And we load it into the client for whatever area of the world you're trying to see. And at the end of the day, you get something that looks something like a map. Right, so MapLibre didn't come falling from the sky. Uh, we actually had a big head start. And uh, yeah, w w how did MapLibre come to be and how did it get started? Yeah, so MapLibre is fundamentally a fork of a previous open source project uh, started by a company called Mapbox. Um, they had libraries for web and for um, native applications. Um, for a very long time, they developed this entirely in the open. It was open source, it was open license, anyone could use this toolkit in any application for any reason, um, and you only had to have the appropriate license. Um, fast forward to 2020, and at this point, a lot of the open source, open data in map industry had, been, had started using this toolkit to create maps. And there was a license change. A new version came out in the web, and instead of being open source, open license, it went to a closed license. So to use this toolkit in the future, you had to pay Mapbox some amount of money. And this created a problem for everyone who was using it for something that you, you, you couldn't pay Mapbox for. 
And for instance, my company, um, we technically compete with them. So we needed a solution that was still in open source. And there were a lot of other companies just like us. Um, so I and four other people ended up coming together. I remember spending a couple days and nights on Twitter trying to get a lot of people organized to come together and create one fork, one community around a open source, open license, community-led project. And as you can imagine, just getting that organized was, was quite a bit of communication and time. It took a couple weeks, if I remember correctly. We ended up signing a, a memorandum to kind of say, yes, we want this to be created. But I didn't know at the time we were just getting started. Um, I don't know how many of you have tried to take over a code base from some previous person that's thousands of lines and doing something as complex as graphical rendering, um, but it's no small task. And we were basically, we had code. We had no infrastructure around the code. We had no organization around the code. We had no maintainers. We just had the code. Um, so our first goal was to start building a community around it. And slowly but surely, Companies join the effort, individuals join the effort, and we, we got started. One good example of this is a few months after the fork, the web version was actually completely tr um, converted from JavaScript to TypeScript, and this was really the first time that we've seen a entirely volunteer effort in the project that pretty much overhauled the entire web project, which was really cool to see. Right, but uh, when you work on a co complex software like this, and uh, another example is like databases, operating systems, uh, you cannot rely, or almost cannot rely on volunteers alone. And uh, we saw uh, the first uh, uh, collaboration or uh, contribution from a, uh, co uh, uh, another company uh, with the Terrain 3D uh, support uh, in uh, Matlibre GL, uh, GS. And we'll see another example uh, very sh shortly. And while this was all happening, there's always obviously the code problem. How do we understand the code? How do we maintain the code? How do we make sure bugs are fixed and development continues? There's also the governance problem. How do we take all this community and, and lead it effectively? Um, and that's really the problem I was focused on solving along with my other board members. And th starting in 2020, we started working on what we call a charter. It's basically a document that tells us how we can run the organization. We had to find a place to keep money. Uh, we didn't want to create a full um, nonprofit, so we ended up finding Open Collective, which allows us to hold money for the organization and, and run our affairs that way. Um, and then finally, in August of 2022, we had a full governing board election. So instead of self-appointed governing board members, we now are fully community-led. Everyone on the board has been voted for. And our job is basically to make sure that when people give us money, it's administered effectively, it's used for things that everyone wants and it benefits the community and not just maybe the single sponsor who gave us the money or one individual corporate entity. Right, so that's what's next, right? So the it, missing piece. Exactly. So right after those governing board elections, we actually started getting sponsors coming in. Um, you can see them here. There's quite a few. And they're not just sponsoring us directly. There's also been quite a bit of development indirectly. And, and Bart will talk about that in a bit. Right. So uh, the reason uh, for, for MapLibre to seek out sponsors is because they wanted to have uh, maintainers uh, for all the, 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 the projects. Because uh, when a project doesn't have a maintainer, it uh, quickly descends into chaos. You need to have someone that uh, reviews incoming contributions, make sure that the contributions are uh, up to a certain standard. Uh, you need to have someone that puts out the releases. You need to have someone that triages uh, box reports that are coming in. And um, this, is, uh, this is where I came into the project. Uh, so this is my uh, my task list. Another something that I've wor spent quite a lot of work on, which will have to be redone for uh, in, in some ways, is uh, managing continuous integration. So when someone makes a pull request for MapLibre native, uh, it actually runs on an actual iOS device, an actual Android device. All these tests, uh, the render tests, uh, uh, unit tests, and uh, yeah, make sure that uh, no new bugs uh, were uh, were introduced. 
Um, also, another good reason for uh, uh, a maintainer in the project is that this year, uh, th more than a million dollars was invested into the project. And to give you a little bit of background, when you talk to the GPU, when you want to make your graphical processing unit draw things on the screen, you need to use uh, what's called a graphics API. And uh, a common open standard used for this is OpenGL. But Apple said 10 years ago that they don't want to continue with this open standard. They want to have their own thing called Metal. And this was sort of a risk because uh, MapLibre Native uh, only supported OpenGL. And if you want to use a MapLibre Native on iOS for mission critical applications like Amazon is doing with their last mile uh, 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 stuff where for the delivery guys, um, you really want to switch to Metal and make sure it works with Metal because Apple could drop support for OpenGL uh, in theory. Uh, and this has been worked on uh, for this past year by a team of, uh, of five engineers. And uh, I'm happy to say that in September of this year, uh, we put out the first uh, MapLibre native uh, release uh, on iOS pre-release which with support for, for Metal. So that project uh, it was very risky from the beginning. Wasn't sure it would actually yield something that wouldn't just completely crash. It has been tried before and many have failed actually. Uh, but that was a great success. So it, looking right now that that development effort, uh, co collaboration between Meta and AWS will actually uh, continue. And we'll see more uh, contributions to MapLibre Native uh, from then. All right, so I'm not alone. Uh, uh, I have a colleague uh, in, the, in the MapLibre team, uh, Harold, uh, who is the maintainer for web. And we also have a great uh, coordinator wh uh, who, whose name I th deserves to be mentioned here. He's really good at, uh, uh, was really good at reeling in the sponsors and uh, defining the message and uh, uh, working on the website and stuff. Uh, this is my favorite quote from Oliver, Oliver our MapLibre native uh, coordinator. I don't care about MapLibre. So what he means by that is, what he cares about is, uh, enabling people to make beautiful maps and create great uh, maps applications. And MapLibre is just the thing that he thinks is most uh, promising uh, right now in the field. Um, so with that said, the future of the project is of course def defined by the community. And anyone can share either code or ideas or opinions, bugs, whatever, and we will shape the future together. But we also have a board, and they uh, are all experienced maps people, and they have some ideas about what the future of Map Libre uh, looks like. So, and I want to add just one more thing about the future is yeah. the fact that we've seen so many industry, large industry players come together. Um, Map Libre is now being used in Meta's most of their apps, in, in like their Facebook app. It's being used in. Um, on Bing search, um, the Bing Maps is mostly Map Libre, and the list keeps going on. Um, and so that, in and of itself, is a huge success of that community-led, agnostic, um, open-source project. So wh where are we headed? Um, there's lots of things that you might want in a map. Um, a lot of people talk about a globe mode. It's really cool to have, and we're talking about how we can make this happen, especially on the native. Um, another thing that will get all the nerds in the room very excited, is the idea of a single um, code base that can run on the web and on native and anywhere. And that's a little bit of the work that's being done in MapLibre RS, using Rust to build that. We don't know if it will work, but it's kind of a greenfield project we're working towards. Lots of other things have to happen. Better documentation, better performance, and the list always goes on. But there's a few of the directions we want to head. Yeah, so another thing is uh, we only su support Web Mercato right now. Uh, that's uh, also something we would like to change in the future. Modernization is another uh, big thing, especially, for example, on iOS. Uh, we're using their uh, Objective-C mainly, while Apple has a new programming language called Swift, and uh, we want to have beautiful Swift APIs that are easy to use for iOS developers. By the way, if you are a developer and you want to work on any of these things, uh, they are great projects in and of themselves, but to sweeten the pot, we actually have uh, money available that we distribute in the form of uh, bounties. So if you want to work on MapLibre and you you uh, want to work for a bounty, then reach out to, to one of the maintainers and uh, yeah, we can maybe uh, support you financially for that as well. So with that said, your to-dos for after the talk. First of all, of course, 
use Mapleaver for your next project or let your developers use it. They will love it. Go to mapleaver.org. We have getting started guides for all the platforms and uh, uh, it should be a breeze. Then, of course, give us a star on GitHub. And while you're there, ask your questions on GitHub discussions, report a bug, request a feature, or maybe even make a pull request. Join us on Slack. We are on the OpenStreetMap US Slack. So that's slack.openstreetmap.us. And uh, a lot of discussion is there. Here's just a screenshot to prove that it's really fun over there and uh, you want to be there. Um, follow us. Follow us. We're on Mastodon and yeah, we're also on X on LinkedIn. But uh, yeah, Mastodon is where it's at these days, of course. And um, if you're really deep into the MapLibre weeds and you want to really shape the nitty gritty details of the library and the style specification and whatnot, join the monthly meeting that we have every second Wednesday of the month. I was just gonna add, this is where the community really gets involved. It's, we, we call it the technical steering committee. Um, some of the board is there, but it's mostly people actually working with the, the code every day or, or a lot. Uh, we have one for the web project and one for the native project, and you can join one or both or just part of it if you need to. Yeah. Uh, but it's where you can actually see what are the discussions with actual pull requests, actual directions, where a lot of the, the nitty gritty decisions are made. Yeah, and uh, it's a lot of fun. It's actually in our charter that we have these. All right, with that said, uh, thank you. There might be some questions after such an inspiring talk. Thank you. Yes. Oh. Um, when you talk about data, uh, you mentioned just OpenStreetMap. Is there a way to add private data or other data to the map? Yeah, absolutely. So fundamentally, it, it, most of the rendering is done with Mapbox vector tiles. It's an open specification that pretty much any data can be turned into. Um, and then it also supports JSON, GeoJSON being imported. You can add custom layers. Um, so. I think a MapLibre GLGS especially has a very flexible data loading mechanism with add protocol. Uh, it's completely data agnostic. You can use your own data, and uh, you're not uh, tied to, to any anything over there. Yeah, basically. Okay. Uh, how, w based on my experience and having talked to several other cartographers, when we've made uh, suggestions for areas to the style specification that we feel could use improvement, uh, such as dash arrays and stuff like that, we often feel like the feedback we get indicates that the people making decisions on what features will be accepted aren't using the style language and aren't driving any development of that, just d the development of the API side of it, not of the styling side of it. How can we get what are generally recognized as pain points with writing styles resolved? That's, That's a tough one. Yeah, it, it is a tough one. And, and, I'll, and I'll kind of back it up and say why you feel that pushback. It's because of there's so many users. We always have to be careful like breaking things. Now, when it's new, like you're talking about with dash arrays, yeah. um, that's something where when I've seen these discussions happen, it, it, it seems to get lost kind of in the minutia of um, we, we all say this is a good thing, and then we have to figure out what's the actual specification. And this is actually one of the, de the, like the downsides of a community-led project. We have to find consensus, and that takes a lot longer than if one of us could just say, we're going to do it this way. Um, so the easiest way to get it done is to keep talking about it. Um, what we found, we, we're, we, and this is why we have maintainers. Like This is part of the process of getting maintainers so that they can have their heads in the code, in the style spec, and to know what needs to happen. Um, so I want it to improve. Um, this is this is an area that I, as a board member, see as a problem, and I want to improve over the next. When you've got when they've got their head in the code that's, and the files protect, that's good. But that doesn't necessarily mean they're using it to do cartography of any interest. This is this was a problem at Batbox as well, from what I've heard internally, is that um, the developers we're not necessarily aware of what the cartographers wanted. And we also take suggestions. Um, 
Like so I, I think a bit more general is uh, like who who gets to call the shots in an open source project. So it's a more general problem here, and uh, that is a very interesting topic. And there's various ways to 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 look at that problem, and there's also various degrees to how much you can formalize that that process. And I think because we're such a young project, we're we're still figuring out how to best solve that and. Uh, um, uh, but there's thinking on this topic, and uh, I think it's more—it's better to have a more general discussion about how do we want to make decisions uh, instead of hey, what this particular decision? Uh, how? Why? Why are we not making progress here? So, uh, but yeah, it's a—it's an interesting topic, and it's, it's definitely something that will be addressed as we become more mature as an open source project. And it's definitely something that at least I, as a board member, say it is a problem, and we need to find ways to to make these decisions and make them. Oops. A decision is better than no decision. Dustin. Yeah, I have one question. Oh, sorry. Uh, Bart, oh, you, sorry. Were you were talking about uh, implementing other projections as well. And I was wondering, what projections do we mean? And, and why do you want to implement different projections? So uh, in general, uh, so it's just general pr uh, alternate projections, not just Web Mercator. And the reason why we might want to implement that is that there are a lot of, especially government users, who uh, stay or might stay away from MapLibre because of limited projection support. So they really need the, 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 the precise projection for their country or their area. And otherwise, they're not just not touching any GIS software. So, yeah. Um, what have been the tr what have the challenges been in sort of taking the plugin ecosystem from previous Mapbox pro Mapbox projects and bringing it forward? Um, as an example, like Mapbox GL Draw used for drawing like lines and polygons on top of maps um, is kind of borderline unmaintained today. Uh, and but like a, lo a lot of people sort of have dependencies on it on it in projects and need alternatives. Um, and like one new newer project is Terra Draw that's uh, kind of emerged from this and is like agnostic to the back end, but like, what's the appetite for sort of um, keeping the plugin ecosystem up to date? Right. Uh, can I answer that, and then you can fill me in what I missed? So, uh, to give, I, I cannot uh, an answer your question specifically about that specific project, but it's true. There is a huge ecosystem of other like helper libraries and plugins that is eff effectively unmaintained and might not work anymore in the future as we divert more from the, the code base that we forked from. Um, MapLibre as an organization is really focused on the core uh, renderers and not so much on the plugins or uh, on the alternate platforms. For example, we also support Flutter. So these are, uh, like we're all one community, but these are, uh, depend on uh, community contributions and community maintainers. So to answer your question, I cannot give you an, an answer that is nice. Like, yeah, we we will also we will give maintainers for all, all the whole ecosystem that that is not that is not being that's not the answer I can give you. But uh, yeah, uh, we do uh, so we have a process of onboarding uh, repositories into the MapLibre uh, uh, workspace on GitHub. And there's a checklist for that. And one of the requirements is uh, there's some maintainer that wants to uh, keep the project alive. So if there's a particular project you want to be become part of MapLibre, uh, you can go to MapLibre slash MapLibre on GitHub, and there's a checklist uh, there for that process. And I think the simple answer is always uh, resources. Our, our core focus is that the renderers work. And then the plugin and the uh, the ecosystem around it has to follow. So I think that as time goes on, as the the organization matures, then more and more plugins will kind of come in under the the full organization with support. Um, but what those plugins are kind of depends on what the community cares about. So, like you said, if you want a plugin, maintain it, please. <laughs> um, you you mentioned MapDB native mm -hmm. and stuff. Um, is there any way to to use it on like a Linux on server side, ah. uh, so you could make server side REST. That's, that, like that's actually a slide we, I cut uh, last oh. minute because I didn't want to complicate it further. But uh, MapLibre native runs on Linux. It even runs on Windows now, thanks to a contribution that was made this year. It runs on your Raspberry Pi. It runs on Mac OS. You can use it with Qt. Uh, there's many more platforms than just iOS and Android. Uh, some people are even using it to render uh, raster tiles, and uh, I think uh, uh, Luke is going to tell something a bit more about it in his presentation tomorrow, uh, in general. 
so yes, you can use it in all kinds of different environments where you can uh, compile C++ for. Oh, cool, interesting. Yeah. The, the simple answer is anywhere OpenGL runs that has a C++ compiler is, is often supported, so. Uh, my question is how difficult it is to make a style because um, there are some styles that are well known like uh, where basically you can see the map like drawn with pencils or like the pirate map style, stuff like that. How difficult will it be to make such a style? You want to mention uh, Maputnik and the, ma the MapLibre style editors that are, f that are around? Yeah, so this is a story generally we want to improve. Um, there is a editor, a style editor called Matt Putnik. Um, it's okay. It's somewhat unmaintained. We're working on the process of seeing if we can bring it in under the organization. Um, if it, it takes a little bit of work to like get into the style specification and understand it, but once you get into it, it's relatively straightforward. I wouldn't ever call it simple. It's still JSON. It's still, uh, you have complex filters, you have complex um, expressions to create the different effects. So I would never call it simple, but I would say that once you understand it, it's it's straightforward to create the, the spec. Paul, you have. So in general, I would say if you've already got the vector tiles, Converting a medium complexity style is a couple of weekends of work, but it's not going to be one to one because generally you're converting from Mapnik. Mapnik is good at certain things and bad at others. MapLibre is good at certain things and bad at others, and those are not the same things. So you, some things that are very easy in Mapnik are impossible in MapLibre, but the reverse is true as well. So if you've got a style design for one, you're going to have to change it a bit. I'll actually talk. I will actually talk a little bit about this tomorrow in my talk. Um, because Damon just moved their styles from from Mapnik to MapLibre, and they had quite the fun with some of those neat effects. So, any other question? Cool. Thanks for Thank listening, you, everyone. everyone. Thank you, Luke and Bart.